Well, uh, just did a Google search on uh, one of my favorite terms, gun control, and uh, came across a number of stories. Actually, it's funny, even though I'm in West Virginia, uh, there is an internet, there's a company that provides internet services to oil rigs, and they are based in Canada. And so my internet actually goes through Canada. And so whenever I go online, I'll get the temperature in Calgary. Whenever I do a Google search, it's actually Google.ca. I have to consciously try and find the uh, you know the regular one. Uh, when I go to Amazon, I always go to Amazon.ca. It's really confusing because they they look the same, but they say CA anyway. So I did a new search on gun control, and in Canada, there's actually been some developments here. Um, Namely, it looks like uh, it is likely that at some point in the near future, or at least in the next couple months, that they will get rid of their so-called long gun registry. Uh, back in the mid-90s, uh, handguns, by the way, have been restricted in Canada and registered for quite a while. Uh, they are legal, uh, but they have been registered for a long time. In 1995, under the prime ministership of Jean Chrétien, uh, they introduced a registry of long guns. Uh, and this has kind of been like a a, uh, a quintessential government program, not just a gun control program, in that they said, well, it'll save lives, it'll save money, it'll pay for itself because you have to pay for the registry. And the idea was people paying for the licenses would pay for all the operating costs. And it can't be demonstrated that it saved anybody's life. It can't be demonstrated that it's had any effect on crime whatsoever. Crime has gone up and down, relatively independent of the registry. And of course, not only does it not pay for itself, but it costs about a billion dollars Canadian, which nowadays is uh, more than a billion dollars, I guess, uh, every year just to keep it going. Or maybe at least in total. I don't know if it's every year now. But it hasn't made money. It's lost money. Anyway, when Stephen Harper, the current prime minister, who is a conservative, I just a little, I'm not an expert on Canadian politics, but for those of you who don't know, they have more than one, two major parties. Uh, they have the NDP and the New Democrats, who are basically the communists. Uh, you have the Liberal Party. Uh, there might be a Labour Party. I'm not sure. There is a Libertarian Party, but it's minute. And then for many years, there was a Tory Party, and then there was a Conservative Party. And uh, in the early 2000s, they merged to just form the Conservative Party. And together, they were able to get the prime ministership. And they elected Stephen Harper, who, you know, he's like, he's like a Republican, but he's like a liberal Lindsey Graham kind of Joe Lieberman Republican. So he's absolutely uh, atrocious and god awful when it comes to basically almost every issue. But he's rhetorically a little bit better than the traditional Canadian socialist things on a few things, and this is one of them. And basically, he kind of has said he wants to get rid of the gun, uh, the long gun registry, and uh, attempts to do so have been thwarted in the past. There's been major, major alarm about this in Canada. Uh, the forces of gun control are very strong in Canada, and they really throw up a big fuss. And I think a year ago, almost it was almost gotten rid of and some liberal MP just had some he was involved in the process somehow and was able to basically just single handedly kill it um, but it looks like it's for sure going to pass uh, parliament I guess it has to go to the upper house they don't it said the senate in the articles I didn't think Canada had a senate uh, so I guess I have to brush up on my Canadian politics but uh, it's good news that it might be uh, repeal is some relatively minor thing, but it's also better news that rhetorically this is being made. But I want to talk about two things related to this. One is uh, kind of a little sociology on Canada and the U.S. Canada and the United States in many ways constitute a, a continuous society. There's Anglo-America, as it said. And there's exceptions to this, like Quebec, you have a francophile, a francophone area, a very large francophone area in Canada, but, uh, you know, can you tell the difference between Americans and Canadians? Not often. Um, and in a lot of ways, you know, I think that Canada is kind of analogous to, you know, both of our parent is 
is Great Britain, is England. And the United States is like the child of the parent who leaves home early because he gets in a fight with his, you know, with, with mom and uh, goes off and becomes the most successful, richest person in history. And then the other brother, the other sibling in Canada, just stays at home and works at McDonald's all the time. Uh, this is kind of how I feel like it. And there's definitely not only an inferiority complex in Canada, but there is a how do we distinguish ourselves from America? You know, if you're the state, you have to engender nationalism. States are always trying to engender nationalism. And depending on the societies that they rule over, this this has different tricks. If they, if they rule over a homogenous society that has one ethnic group, usually it's going to be racist somehow, you know, so uh, the Serbians, if everybody who lives there is Serbian, they're going to say, hey, Serbians are great, Serbians are awesome, other people are bad. The Han Chinese are like this, I think. You know, the Russians are kind of like this. Americans, it doesn't quite work that way because it's all a hodgepodge. But it has, other, it has a more sophisticated, but it does gender nationalism. Canada has a much harder time, and their government attempts to do so. If you watch the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, a crown corporation, by the way, a blatantly mercantilist uh, corporatist organization, like much of the industry in Canada is, they, they actively attempt to engender nationalism. And the big impediment to this is the United States. And so one of the major things that they attempt to do is point out differences between Canada and the United States, and they try and uh, emphasize those as much as they can. And the biggest one by far isn't gun control at all. It is uh, health care. They like to say, look, Americans, yeah, they're great, but we have universal health care. We're more sophisticated and you know, humane and whatever. And that's, I mean, I think the worst thing that could happen in Canada is if the United States got universal health care. Because not only then would Canadians be unable to get health care treatment here, which many of them do, it's an industry in Canada, but then they lose like one of their major identifying characteristics that they can point to and say, look, Canada is different than the United States and this is why, if we have the same health care. But another area, I don't know if it's the second most important, but it's important, is gun control. Now, Canada is one of those interesting countries where really they have a high per capita gun ownership rate, and guns actually still have an active role in much of Canadian society. Mostly because a huge part of Canada is rural, and not only rural, but exceedingly rural. And so firearms play a point. There's a, there's a very large hunting culture in areas, not, not in the cities, not in Toronto or southern Ontario, but in the city, in, in the rural areas. Uh, which have a large part of the population. They also have a lot of hunting tourism from the United States. I wouldn't be surprised if hundreds of thousands, if not millions of gun-toting Americans vacation in Canada. I mean, I know people who've done it. And these are hardcore NRA types who will go to Canada every year to kill a bear or a moose or something. And all that rubs off. The other thing is, it's interesting. So they have relatively high per capita gun ownership rates. Guns are relatively easily available. There is a registration. It's a little bit harder. There's restrictions on certain types. Uh, the, the major, major difference is in Canada, the idea that you can use guns for self-defense is not accepted really very much at all. I mean, there are people who believe that. It has been done. People have used guns in self-defense. There is a case in a city by Vancouver where a jeweler, a guy who owned a jewelry store, where they repeatedly robbed, illegally was able to obtain a, a, a handgun, and he killed a robber, he shot a robber, and it was a big deal. I mean, he was, I think he was charged with a crime, I think he was arrested, but I think they eventually charged him with something much less. They didn't really, they didn't come down on him real hard, like say it happens in the UK or New York City. But it's not acceptable. When the politicians in Canada speak about gun ownership, it is always in terms of hunting and sporting, the idea that you can use it for self-defense, which is essentially accepted through the vast majority of the United States, uh, is not accepted in Canada. Interestingly, though, the use of guns in self-defense from animals is not only accepted, but is one of the main justifications for having a gun. 
Uh, if you live in northern parts of Canada or areas where there are grizzly bears or polar bears or even elk or moose, um, it's actually irresponsible to go out and do recreational things and not have a gun. And I've seen videos of people who uh, have like very powerful handguns, uh, big, big revolvers, high, high caliber revolvers, using the scare away grizzly bears. And that's that's fine. That's no big deal. But if they had been if they had been attempted if they had been attacked by something far more dangerous, say a human with another weapon. I mean, yeah, a grizzly bear is actually a very dangerous thing. But a human a human who comes to get you if they're armed, that's actually more dead, deadly. That would be considered beyond the pale of that, which is kind of an interesting. Uh, you know, that doesn't make a lot of sense. But that is the, the acceptance in Canada now. Of course, they have much stronger gun control movement in Canada. Unlike the gun control people in this country, they are actually overt about calling for you know confiscation. Uh, the gun control people here, they're reluctant to say self-defense is okay, but they readily admit they're like sporting hunting is okay. In Canada, you know, they're two steps removed. They're obviously self-defense isn't even generally accepted. Uh, use for hunting and sporting is rejected by the gun control people. The gun control people are basically saying only the government or maybe like security guards, that sort of thing. Or government agents who aren't at work, like Mounties uh, or something like that who are off duty. Uh, the other thing is the idea that you can use guns to like resist tyranny. That's not that it's widely acknowledged in the United States. It's not popular, although it's, I think it's getting more slowly. In Canada, that's completely out of the question. You don't even talk about that. It's also interesting because there's so much pro gun rhetoric and material produced in the United States. Since Canadians speak English, since they're next to the United States. Well, got people in Canada end up reading a lot of this, and they will say things like, we have a right to self-defense, we have a right to bear arms, which they don't, at least according to the Canadian Constitution. There's no uh, history of jurisprudence in Canada that says that obviously there are human rights, it's quite, you have a right to defend yourself, and you have a right to own property, ergo, you have the right to own guns, I don't care what country you live in, but in terms of the political discourse in Canada, you don't. You don't have any rights, actually, you're just a subject of the Queen, and her representatives in the government. So that's the interesting sociological look. The other question here more generally is that of registration. Now registration is one of those gun control measures which there aren't any gun, gun control groups that don't recommend it and it's one of those things that if it isn't in place it's one of the things that is thought that needs to be in place but it's actually one of the more absurd things at least in terms of preventing crime. There's no evidence that registration in any way has any effect on crime whatsoever. Obviously, there are many countries that have registration, either of all firearms or of different types. Within the United States, we do have registration on state to state. Illinois registers all guns. Many states register certain types of guns, especially handguns. In my state, Michigan, registers handguns. It doesn't register assault rifles. It doesn't register semi-automatic guns or any number of very powerful weapons, but it does register handguns. That's, that's very common. And anybody who looks at the data basically has to scratch their head and say, well, we don't, there's no, there's no indication that the introduction of registration reduces crime at all or has any effect or makes it go up for that matter. It doesn't do anything. And the citations that people make to show how effective it is, for instance, in Canada, when people, I've watched a couple of shows where, you know, they'll have the two pundits debated and one will say it hasn't reduced crime and the, the gun control person will say, oh, well, but the police use it so many thousands of times a day. Well, of course, it's in the law that the police are actually obligated to check the registry every time they go to a house. So if they get a call that says, you know, there's a domestic violence at this address, they will go and they will check the registry and see if there was, if, if that house has a gun registered there. Uh, and then that counts as, oh, let's see the registry works. But if you think about it, that's retarded because uh, if you go, if you encounter a building, uh, if you go, if you walk into a situation where there's a belligerent, you cannot assume that they don't have a gun, even if their house isn't on the registry. Hey, you don't know who's in the house, so the how the person who lives in the house might not have a gun registered to them, but their boyfriend who's there, they might, and that's not going to come up in the registry. The other thing is there might be an intruder, 
they might have gotten a gun illegally. And basically, the only sane policy of a police officer is to assume the potential for there to be a gun there. It is absolutely insane and totally being very dangerous to just think, you know what, let's just assume we check the registry so there's not, not going to be a gun, so I'm just going to waltz into the house willy-nilly, you know, with my guard down because I know there's not a gun there. You don't know that there's not a gun there. You have to assume that there is, whether there's a registry or not. And if you ever watch the show, like, Alaska State Troopers, which I don't watch often, but I saw one where, you know, he just says, look, we just assume everybody has a gun because it, statistically they probably do, but it just doesn't make any sense to think that people don't have guns when they always could even with the registry someone could have a gun when it says that they don't so Canadian police officers assume that people have guns whether they check the registry or not the fact that they've been mandated to check the registry is not proof that the registry is valuable and that's the only stat that they come up with look how many times it's been checked uh, but the reasons why a registry uh, is not effective is people can still steal guns, people can manufacture guns, they can be illegally imported. In any situation, you don't know all the individuals who are going to be involved. When police get called to a crime, they don't get a memo that says, okay, these are the 10 individuals who are going to be there, and so they, they can check. Okay, well, let's check and see if they have guns, assuming none of them stole it or anything. They get called, there's a domestic dispute, there's a shooting, they don't know who was there, so they don't know who to even check, even assuming you had a perfect registry. So it doesn't work like that. But what what it does do is it is a necessary first step to confiscation. That's what a registry is good for. It doesn't do anything about crime. It's a hassle and it's an expense, so it can actually reduce gun ownership by discouraging people. People will say either not buy because they don't want to be registered, or they'll not buy because they can't afford the increased price that is incurred by the registration, which always will raise costs. Uh, this is why, uh, you know, when the debates happen, the, gun can, the pro gun person says, hey, this is just a, a step to confiscation. Uh, you know, the, the socialist any state gun control person will always say, oh, you're just being paranoid. But really, logically, it's the only justification to have a registration. Now, I don't think that everybody who advocates registry registration really thinks that because most people just, they have a, a reflexive, I support gun control, and so I support a registry. They're not thinking through and thinking, okay, well, what could this actually do against crime? But the organizations like the Brady Campaign and the government especially the more evil people in government, like the Clintons and Chuck Schumer and all them, they, they I think, purposely want registration for that purpose. They understand, by the way, you know, the way it works is when you get registration, it's not like, well, well no one's going to confiscate guns now. That's true. No one is going to confiscate guns now. But you get the registration in place, and so when it is more politically able to do, then it's already ready. You know, they can't just confiscate guns out of the blue. That would never work. There's too many. And, of course, in the United States, uh, it may be completely... A, we may be past that point anyway, even with a registration, because there's so many guns in so many places. And plus, the United States has such an enormous industrial base, despite what I may have said in my last video, that the ability to produce guns domestically, even on the black market, is rather substantial, I would say. It's not happening now because you can get them legally, but that's so, I mean, if they became illegal, people would just start making them illegally, illicitly. So, uh, registration, uh, only real logical function is for later confiscation. Uh, and it, since it doesn't do anything for crime, it's totally unjustifiable. And uh, gun rights people should never accept registration. What we have now, the NICS background check, that is not a true registration. I think that is actually a a proto-registration. Since it's not required on private sales, uh, it is plausible for people to say, yes, I bought a gun, yes, you the FBI background check on it, but I sold it since then. They could have done so legally, and that would be very hard 
they can't just assume everybody's lying and secretly keeping their guns, although I'm sure a lot of people will do that. Uh, it, it would be very, very difficult uh, the way the system is set up now to have it on its own become a registration now. They could do some changes to it, make it that way, sure. That's what all this talk about closing the gun show loophole is really about. There is no gun show loophole, by the way. There, all seller people who have licenses to sell firearms have to do a background check. That's if they go to their store. That's if you go to them at the gun at the at the gun show. The federal government doesn't care if there are private sales, though. Now, different states have different things. There are registrations of private sales in certain states. Uh, but that is what they're really, when they refer to the gun show loophole, they're talking about private sales, basically. And that would be a registration. And that would be absolutely terrible. That would be a very bad thing to happen. Fortunately, I don't see that on the, on the horizon. Uh, but that's not to say, hey, we're, we're one terrorist attack away, one mass shooting, all these last mass shootings have not garnered any support for gun control, so hopefully that trend continues. Uh, from to somebody passing a bill saying you have to register privately. So there's no point. Registration does not lower crime, does not affect crime, it costs money, it wastes resources, and it only logical function is as a prelude to confiscation, which in Canada, again, they have the registry and the gun control people, and now that they have that, what do they call for? They're calling for confiscation. If not of all guns, of certain classes first, and then later classes. That's the, that was the whole point in the beginning. So, 